It was September 2013. I was standing in a hotel lobby with hundreds of others who were attending a conference when all of a sudden, on the giant screens up above, came the headlines. This is what it said. We have only one week to save them. It was the words of Brigadier General Paul Kennedy, and he was referring to the thousands of victims of Typhoon Haiyan who are now trapped in the Philippines with no access to ports and no operating runways. There was a journalist embedded there, and he was filming the hordes of people walking the dirt path headed from the coast into Tacloban City, obviously in hopes of finding food and water there. And this journalist noticed a young lady carrying an infant and a little bit older child leave the main path and head down a narrow path and into an abandoned building, only to emerge a few minutes later with just the older child. So the curious journalist went to her and asked why she didn't have the younger child with her. And this is what she said. We've been days now without anything to eat or drink. We've just heard the news that in Tacloban City, there is no more food and water and likely won't be for seven to 10 days. I don't have food and water for all of us. So I had to choose one child to save. Now for me, the next couple of days at this conference, it was pretty difficult to concentrate. Why does something like this happen in the 21st century? Why does any woman in this world, on this planet today, have to make that kind of decision? Well, at the time I was a fund manager, but for years before I'd worked as a paramedic in disaster response teams throughout the US, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And it got me to thinking, you know, in, in emergency work, teams have standards, we have protocols. And, and these formulas that we use are based on best practices and, and they're taught to most everyone about the same way throughout the world so that all that we need to do to get the job done is the proper tools in the right place. So that got me to thinking, what keeps us from creating a network of strategically prepared containers with food, water, and other basic necessities stored in strategic locations around the world? And so I went home and I put together a team and we started designing and constructing what we called food relief vaults. Containers with water filtration and everything needed to prepare and serve 80,000 meals. All inside a single shipping container with a 15 plus year shelf life. And after almost a million meals have now been manufactured, we're working with the largest government agencies to build a massive preparedness network so that we can respond in moments to most anywhere in the United States and surrounding territories. But, but as, as we went into the, into the other countries around the world, outside of our own borders, we found that things were quite different. And, and quite frankly, they were a lot more complex. You see, in other countries, in many countries at least, food insecurity isn't something that happens just after a natural disaster. There's regular droughts and famines. There are crop failures, and those are the worst. And they're exacerbated by depleted soils, poor quality seed, and hardly any use of irrigation and fertilizer. So it means that the crop production goes up and down. It means that the prices go up and down. And this volatility is horrible for farmers and for manufacturers alike. And, and you know what? It perpetuates a cycle of, vol of, of uh, poverty. So, you know, if, if you consider that issue along with the global facts, the global challenge we have, like 760 million people plus tonight are gonna to go to bed hungry. And many of them, by the way, are farmers. And a large percentage of them are severely malnourished. And if you compound that with the understanding that in just 30 years, we're gonna have two billion more mouths to feed on this planet, it should become pretty clear, if not abundantly clear. We need a plan. Well, to me, it seems like a math problem, but it's a big one. It's gonna take all of us. It literally is gonna require collaboration. So what I'd like to ask today is, if you could imagine doing something that we've never done on the, in this world before, but we together could create a zero hunger formula. 
To me, it starts out pretty simple. It gets complex later, but it starts out this way. If you look at the resources that we have, what we produce to feed who we have, and you add to that the new people we're going to have to feed, and you, you adjust it for those technologies and those efficiencies that we're bringing into the marketplace, and then you also adjust it for those things that are limited, like water. We can literally create an algorithm that will lead us to zero hunger. Now, as we started walking through the details, we were lucky enough to get to Uganda and meet a, a really neat fellow named Henry Masoke. Now, Henry was raised in a farming family, and he was blessed to have a mother and father that taught him not just the value of crop rotation, but of diversification, of growing not just bananas, but sweet potatoes and common beans. And they leveraged their success to take a chance after the fall of Idi Amin to grow coffee. And they leveraged that and used all of their resources they saved for years to send Henry to university. And you know what? Henry didn't disappoint. Henry came back and taught everyone that he knew everything that he had learned. And his dedication to community, it didn't go unnoticed either. Some folks at a place called the Gates Foundation awarded Henry a scholarship to attend a university in the Midwest of the United States, Iowa State University where he learned even more about farming as a system, the importance of high quality soil, the value of hybrid seed, and the potential for fertilizer and irrigation to dramatically increase production. And he did it again. He came back to his own home area and he taught this time more than a thousand farmers what he had learned. And you know what? they learned that they could double their production of soy and sometimes triple their production of maize just from what they had learned from Henry's tools and techniques. So our question obviously was, Henry, why isn't everyone doing this? Why isn't everybody spending money on fertilizer? Why isn't everybody buying high quality seeds when they can see clearly the benefits? Well, the answer is probably best summed up by a fellow named Seneca, a Greek philosopher who put it this way. If you have everything to lose, you have a necessarily skewed view of risk. And that couldn't be truer than with a smallholder farmer in sub-Saharan Africa. When you're asking them to spend their last dollar to buy higher quality seed when they already have some, to buy fertilizer that they don't normally use, they're very hesitant, even when they see the great potential that it has. But you know what? You and me and the rest of the world, we need those farmers to take that risk. We need them to take that risk if we're going to solve for hunger. The smallholder farmer is the key. So what do we do? Well, we start by looking at systems. These are the attributes that it's going to take. The zero hunger formula is the catalyst but the attributes are the key. It has to be built on systems. And this means that we've got to move away from looking at agriculture in projects and programs. It means that we have to look at agriculture in each geographical area as an integrated ecosystem. And that means that governments, businesses, and bankers all need to, con to coordinate together and collaborate to solve this problem which means that we need great leaders in each of those areas. Secondly is we need it to be flexible. We, we're talking about so many different varieties of agriculture. Each one of them has got to have its own set of best practices. And if we can do that properly, it'll be scalable. And it's got to be scalable if we're going to roll it out across the planet. Thirdly, and probably the most important, is it has to be profitable. If everyone in the value chain, the smallholder farmer, the manufacturer, and everyone else, all those stakeholders are not seeing a rise in income, it's very likely that that value chain won't be sustainable. It's got to be profitable from farm to fork. What we're really talking about is empowering smallholder farmers. What we're really, you know what we're really talking about? We're talking about developing more Henrys, right? Well, to catalyze this effort, what we've done is we're in the process of launching an interactive website where you can go to share information, facts and figures, as well as best practices on every major value chain in agriculture, where you can go to get that information as well. And you know what? 
if we embrace a common formula, if we're all on the same page, if we lift these smallhold farmers out of poverty like I know we can, not only will we take them from poverty to low income, we will actually, if we use the right technologies and we support them in the proper way, they'll go to middle income, which means that they will now have capacity for health care. They'll now be able to afford proper education. There's an increased likelihood they'll have better nutrition. And you know what else? Here's a little side thing. You'll also create the single largest economic boom that our planet has seen in our lifetime. And we can absolutely do this. It's absolutely doable if we do it together. Thank you.